Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. And uh, as I mentioned uh, a couple hours ago, this uh, things in Ukraine are, are heating up. Uh, Ellen Ratner was with us with our Talk Radio News report just a few minutes ago. And she said that uh, there might be breaking news, that there is some sort of a resolution uh, going on in Ukraine. But I, wanna, I really wanted to dig into this with somebody who really understands this stuff and understands it at, at a level and with a depth that most of us uh, have, uh, certainly I, uh, have nothing close to. Uh, Stephen Cohen is with us. He's a contributing editor to The Nation. He's Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU and Princeton. And his book, which examines the, the new Cold War and is now available in paperback, is titled Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives. And, and, of course, the nation is thenation.com. And, uh, Professor Cohen, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for joining us. It's, it's, it's great talking with you. I've, we've talked on television. I yep. think this might be the first time you've been on our radio program. It is, yep. um, first of all, uh, I think progress. Hayes Brown wrote a piece just uh, hours ago. This was at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, Vladimir Putin's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And um, uh, it, it speaks rather poorly of Mr. Putin. What's, what's going on in Ukraine? What's the backstory of this? And, um, and let, let's start with that. Yeah, give us a Ukraine 101. I published a few days ago, it's the cover story of the nation, <clears throat> excuse me, Tom, uh, an article called Distorting Media Distortions, Distorting Russia, Putin, Sochi, Ukraine. Uh, what I argued is that for 20 years, the media, the American media narrative, the mainstream narrative that we've gotten of Russia has been badly distorted. Why that's so could be a separate issue, but it's come to bear now on Putin personally, uh, Ukraine, and certainly the run-up to Sochi. If we start at the beginning with Ukraine, because I think this is potentially a historic uh, event we're watching unfold in Ukraine. Let me get to the punchline. It's possible that the end result will be a new Cold War divide in Europe for generations. Whether Ukraine is partitioned into two states or just remains in a kind of insipid political civil war, uh, but a Cold War divide in Europe that is not as was the 45 year Cold War far away in Berlin, but right on Russia's borders, and right through the very heart of Russia's historical, political, cultural, religious civilization. And that would mean instability and the potential of war for, I'm older than you, Tom, our kids and my grandkids. So this could be really something uh, historic that we're witnessing. But let's flash back to how this began. It began 400 years ago, but... The reality is, and this is not addressed by the American media in any focused way, there is no the Ukraine. There is no the Ukrainian people. Though that's the way the media tells the story. The Ukrainian people and the Ukraine are yearning to escape the thug Putin's Russia to the democratic and prosperous Western Europe. The reality is, at a minimum, there are two Ukraines. One in the West, which does indeed yearn to join Europe, or at least Poland and Lithuania. We'll see what they find if they get there. And uh, mainly in eastern, but to a certain extent, southern Ukraine, a budding Russia, a people, Ukrainians, who are ethnically, linguistically, religiously, politically, historically, culturally, and by millions of mixed marriages with Russians, um, who want to remain with Russia politically and economically. So now flash to the beginning of the current story. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm fighting a cold of all this crazy weather. It's quite all right. um, in November, the European Union, the EU, said to who is, after all, the democratically elected president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, though we're told to hate him very much, but he was elected. You must choose now between an economic affiliation with the EU or one with Russia. So the real culprit, if we're asking how this horrible scene we're witnessing, I mean, Kiev is burning, I mean, dozens of people are dead, hundreds are wounded, it could be much worse. If you want to ask who pulled the trigger in the short run, it wasn't Putin. It wasn't.
wasn't Viktor Yanukovych the president of Ukraine. That's the media narrative. It was the EU's ultimatum to the democratically elected a president of a profoundly divided country. Now, at that moment, and I know I'm going on too long, but this is the context. At that moment, in November, December, Putin said, wait a minute, guys. Why does Ukraine have to choose? How about a tripartite arrangement, he called it, whereby both Russia and the European Union will financially help Ukraine get out of its terrible economic crisis, because Ukraine was then three months ago, remains today, on the verge of financial collapse, can't pay its debts, it's going to default. It's going to be horrible pain for the Ukrainian people. Putin's offer for a three-way arrangement was flatly rejected by Washington and Brussels. Now, we why? Might, well, you want to say you want to ask why now, or you want to wait? That's okay, uh, yeah. No, but, but pardon the my interrupting. Is, keep the keep you know, your story is great. The point is, the pro-Western Ukrainians, when Yanukovych did reject the EU's offer and accepted instead uh, the fifteen billion dollar loan Putin offered. That brought the protesters into the street. Now, remember one thing. So far as we know, he might have secretly, Yanukovych has signed no long-term agreements with Russia. He just took the $15 billion, which Ukraine desperately needed. What did the EU offer? Because to a certain extent, it was a bidding war. I mean, it was like purchasing a used car. Everybody was raising, or at a tobacco auction where I grew up in Kentucky. I used to love to go to tobacco auctions, you know, where they you raised your hand or shouted out your bid. The EU offered 800 million dollars, euros, sorry, 800 million euros, and Russia offered 15 billion dollars. All right, so the it EU no offered brainer. a little over a billion dollars. It was no brainer. It was yeah. no brainer. So that got the people in the streets, and from there it's gone from bad to worse with all sorts of unsavory people. I would call them quasi fascist now playing playing a role. So that's how we got where we are today. Now, if you want to ask why Washington and Brussels rejected the, um, the, the Putin's offer of a three-way agreement, that will take us into heresy that's not permitted in America. If you want to join me, I'll be happy to tell you. Yes, uh, we have about a minute and a half before the break. I, I can do it in 30 seconds. Cool. After the Soviet Union ended, uh, the West, led by the U.S., began a march toward post-Soviet Russia. It began with the expansion of NATO under Clinton. It continued under Bush. It continued under Obama. It's featured not only NATO expansion, but missile defense on Russia's border, a military outpost in the former Soviet Republic of, of Georgia, and now the West is at the gates of Ukraine. End of story. Or first chapter, sorry. Whoa. So this is about the expansion of empire in a way, is it not? I don't ever use the word empire. I mean, I, because I want to win over people who don't like that kind of language. But we could say it's a good policy that Russia is a rotten country and we should do everything we can to weaken it, encircle it, even take it over. I think it's reckless, brought us to a new Cold War. And, uh, and they've got nukes. they got everything. You know. they got more weapons of mass destruction than anybody. Not only nukes, but chemical, biological, the whole kit and caboodle. So this has been a reckless bipartisan policy. Uh, Democrats, Republicans, progressives, I mean, they bang this drum on MSNBC, too. Right. Uh, so what am I to say? There are five or six of us of strange political coloration in the United States protesting, and we can speak out on a handful of programs, including yours. We're talking with Dr. Stephen Cohen, contributing editor to The Nation, professor emeritus of Russian studies and politics at New York University, NYU, and Princeton. Uh, he writes for The Nation, thenation.com, and his most recent book is now out in paperback. It's titled Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, which examines the new Cold War. We'll be back with more, Dr. Cohen, and, and your calls for him, should you have questions right after this. This is the Tom Hartman Program. What is actually going on in Ukraine? What does it have to do with Russia? What does it have to do with us? And could this be the beginning of a world war? Welcome back. Dr. Cohen, you're still with us? I am, and you don't have to call me doctor. Okay. Well, I, I try I to... Ma- I do not make house, house calls. Okay. Uh, Stephen, uh, yeah. Mr. Cohen. Steve yeah. will be fine. 
on. Steve, okay, thank you. Um, our commercial stations have gone to break. We are with our Free Speech TV audience and our uh, Pacifica audience, which are not insignificant. Uh, although anything you say of great importance in the next four minutes, I will probably ask you to repeat very, very briefly when, we, when our commercial stations rejoin us. Um, you, you mentioned that it is a collection, you are, one, you are one of four or five or six voices, seven voices in America who are uh, addressing, who are heretics to the orthodoxy, I guess. Uh, my phrase is not yours, but... No, that's my phrase. I'd accept that. There's okay. orthodoxy, which is the mainstream view of Russia and our policy, and there are a few heretics running around. Yeah. And why is that? I don't know, because, uh, look, I've been around a long time, Tom. I entered uh, academic life uh, as a professor in the early 70s and rather quickly became, uh, I, I got into the mass media, writing for op-ed pages, being on TV. In the 70s and 80s, the dispute was between people who thought we needed more, more Cold War with Soviet Russia, and we needed something called detente, right. which was remo- re- reducing conflict. And that was American democracy at work. Uh, and, and that was Nixon Kissinger, wasn't it, did uh, Lots of people. I mean, I began with Eisenhower and Carter had a puzzle. But here's the point. There were loud, articulate, and politically powerful voices on both sides. I was on the detente side, but we had senators who supported us. We had people who ran for president. The New York Times, the Washington Post, called up and said... You want to be on our op-ed page opposing somebody who disagrees with you? And we said, yes, today that's ended. There's one hand clapping, and that's this triumphalist, winner-take-all American policy toward post-Soviet Russia, which the mainstream media has followed. Now, why there's not more opposition to it, I'm not sure. One reason is we've been deluded into thinking that when the Soviet Union ended, all our existential dangers ended with it. We know that's not so. Uh, We were even told nuclear war is now impossible. We now know that's not so, or why would the United States be spending trillions of dollars on missile defense? But there was something, I think, that entered our bloodstream. We were the indispensable, triumphant, uh, virtuous nation, and here's the key phrase, the only superpower. That kicked in in about 1991, 1992, about 25 years ago. So we've raised a whole generation of Americans, including my 22-year-old daughter, on that false narrative of American history. And where is Russia in that? Well, Russia is in there, at least it was in the 90s, when there was a supplicant Russian president, uh, Boris Yeltsin, in the position that Japan and Germany were in after World War II. That is okay, we beat you, and you, you were bad, but now we will help you become good, and here's how it's going to happen at home. And by the way, in international affairs, please carry our spears. Well, that's what we tried to do with Russia in the 1990s, and a handful of us, including the late George Kennan, the great American thinker about U.S.-Russian relations, lived into his hundreds, died a few years ago. He said, There's go- you're, you're creating a backlash in Russia. Right. And the name of that backlash is Vladimir Putin. Well, wow. yeah. Boy, he was, he was prophetic. Um, Dr. Stephen Cohen is with us. We'll be back with more. And, uh, I have some questions. We'll pick up your questions for Dr. Cohen. He's with us for the hour. Stick around. where smart people get their news. Uh, Stephen Cohen is with us. He is a contributing editor to The Nation, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU and Princeton, and his book, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, which examines this new Cold War, is now available in paperback. Um, uh, Steve, the, uh, just, to, just to kind of recap, and, and, a, and a question, in fact, a conspiracy theory I'd like to run by you. Um, you mentioned that the American consensus, basically, since the early 90s, since the fall of the Soviet Union, has been that there's only one superpower in the world. It's us. We're triumphalist. Um, and uh, unlike Germany and Japan, uh, we beat them, and now they're buddies with us. Russia, we beat them uh, in the Cold War, but they're not so much buddies with us. And 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 uh, that we used to have 
you know, two sides of this argument. There was the detente side that said, let's be cooperative, collaborative even with the Soviet Union and or the Russians. And then there was the, the let's have a Cold War side. And, and now it's all Cold War rhetoric, both on the right and the left. Could it be? First of all, did I, have I accurately characterized? Yeah, the, I think so. Okay. I think that's a rough approximation okay, of our great. landscape today. Could it, and, and the question that both of us were asking kind of out loud is, why is it that there is no honest debate in the American media or in the American body politic? You don't have a single senator standing up saying, wait a minute, how about detente with Putin? Could it be that there's no money to be made. I mean, we're we're in in the middle of a of a very very deeply connected economic relationship with both Germany and Japan. We are not with Russia, and the only way that we can make money it, with regard to Russia, to the extent that our politics in America are driven by money, the only way we can make money with them is to arm up against them. Does that make any sense? Well, it's, as Russians like to say, this is a favorite Russian expression, it's a theory that has the right to exist and ought to be discussed. But let me tell you one of the counter, or maybe it's not a counter argument, it's this. Back in the 70s and 80s, when the pro-detente movement was strong enough to field candidates, uh, we had a grassroots movement, which was called the Stop the Nukes Anti-Nuke Movement. Uh, there were a lot of grassroots folks involved in trying to cut back on the nuclear arms race or end it altogether. That movement is, I don't want to say it's gone, because I know good folks are out there, but it's no longer a factor in American national politics. The people who were a factor in favor of detente, and this goes to your point, were corporate executives who wanted to do business with Soviet Russia. I'll name you some names. Donald Kendall, who was head of PepsiCo, wanted to beat Coca-Cola in the Soviet Russia. Sure. Uh, Tom Watson, head of IBM, wanted to be the person that flooded Russia with computers. We had a pro-detente organization. It was called the American Committee for East-West Accord. It had a lot of eminent people. Eminent means old. Uh, some younger ones, as I was then. But Kendall and Watson were on our board, and they paid for the offices. They funded this. In other words, they understood that Cold War political relations was screwing up their business. Now, you would think today, when you have even more American corporations who want to tap, in, tap into what is a vast Russian growing middle-class market, everything from Taco Bell and McDonald's to uh, American movies and... Uh, Gap Clothewear, uh, everybody wants to get there, not to mention cars and oil and nickel and all this, these natural resources, you would think that corporate executives today would be on our side. So the question in my mind is, because it's bad for their business, I'm giving you the counter-argument to what mm -hmm. you're saying, if, why aren't they? Why aren't they saying to the presidents to whom they have access and the secretaries of state, hey, this is crazy. What is this crazy Magnitsky law that Congress published that, 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 that really was humiliating? And why isn't Obama going to Sochi? After all, uh, Putin saved him from humiliation in August when he got Assad to give up his chemical weapons. And unless the president or the vice president or the secretary of state goes to Moscow uh, in a politically at least uh, neutral way and advocates trade relations, we're giving all the business to Germany and China, and mm -hmm. Italy. Uh, we're a small player in the Russian economic market. So I don't know, Tom, I'm looking in my own mind for something more psychological and political. Mm. Why, and, and by the way, I'm going to be absolutely candid, there's a lack of civic, civil, civic courage. I know Congress people who, who read what I write, or hear me, or call me, and say, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. And I say, great, I'll be looking forward to your speech on the floor of the House or some press conference, Crickets, and they right? don't say anything. And I, you know what? I think they may think that the American people will turn against them. But I've never, I grew up in Kentucky, was educated in Indiana, lived in Florida, taught in New Jersey, lived in New York. I've never run into masses of American people who want to smite the Russians. This is a disease of our American political class. Well, and, and China, I mean, was the great boogeyman of, of, of my generation as a young person. You know, China is going to flip the dominoes of Southeast Asia, and we've got to stand against them in Vietnam. Right. And, uh, boy, are we in bed with China right now. 
And I they're mean, still, it's still I don't think the you're communist. that old to remember China and Vietnam, Tom. That's something you read, I think. Yeah. <laughs> in my dreams. I, mean. <laughs> I do remember that well, and you're 100% right. Look, yeah. let me give you a hypothetical, and let me give you a piece of, uh, of news that you might not know. Uh, maybe, because he's toxic otherwise to a lot of us, but maybe, one of the, not maybe, one of the most outspoken voices protesting this craziness <clears throat> in America toward Putin, has been Patrick Buchanan. Hmm. Buchanan has said that Putin's our partner, that's what I say, that we need to make him our partner to make the world safe. Now, Putin has a sidebar, I mean, excuse me, Buchanan. About two years ago, Putin began calling himself a conservative. And in these two years, he's given a series of public speeches defining his conservatism as basically traditional family values plus Stability plus sovereignty plus national or uh, nationalism, yeah. right? Plus national, which is Pat Buchanan's agenda. Yeah, but and there's an anti-gay uh, agenda buried in here. Well, Pat fell in love with this. Yeah, and I think if you asked him who would be the ideal president of the United States, he'd nominate Putin. But the point is, you're getting a few people around the spectrum marginalized who do see, though, that for our national security, what we want Obama to do is embrace Putin's at least in international affairs. Hang on just a second, Steve. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. We are talking with Stephen Cohen, contributing editor with The Nation, author of the book Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives. We'll be back in six minutes with more, Dr. Dr. Cohen. Welcome back to the Tom Hartman Radio Program, broadcasting on commercial stations from coast to coast on Sirius XM all across the North American continent, on Pacifica stations across America, Europe, and Africa, on American Forces Radio, and every U.S. military base in the world, and simulcast as TV on both Dish Network, Direct TV, and cable systems nationwide. Uh, with us is Dr. Stephen Cohen, or Professor Stephen Cohen, Steve Cohen, the uh, contributing editor to The Nation, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU and Princeton. Uh, the author of the book Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, which examines the new Cold War and is now available in paperback, and most recently, the cover story of the March 3rd edition of The Nation magazine, and this brilliant article, Distorting Russia, How the American Media Misrepresents Putin, Sochi, and Ukraine. Uh, Steve, you're still with us? I'm here. Okay. Is there, I've got a bunch of people who have questions for you on the phone. Before we get to those, is, is you know, do you want to quickly summarize, or is there anything you wanted to add to the things that you've said up to this point? just want to say that uh, the article you mentioned has won me some new friends and lots of new enemies. Uh, and the argument of the enemies of the article is, and I'll summarize Charles Krathammer on the Bill O'Reilly show, Cohen likes Putin better than he likes America. In other words, that's to shut down a discussion that I'm not a patriot. Right and that there, we, there's no need to discuss the issues I raise about policy and media coverage. And the short answer to this is, is that a real patriot is deeply worried about American national security. And a real patriot understands that we need allies to help face the dangers, and that Russia is the one that could be the most valuable. So it's people like Krathammer who are not the patriots, because they're engaged in some polemical ideological war that should have ended 40 years ago. And they blind us and they blind the country to the imminent dangers. And so uh, it's very hard to get this conversation focused on the issues amid all this name-calling. And I've seen it before, but it is discouraging. Yeah, in, in a way it's just a repeat of the rhetoric that we heard against Etat 30, it is, it 30 is. 40 years ago. It is, Yeah. Okay, let's pick up some calls here. Rick in Royal, Royal or Port Royal, Pennsylvania. Rick, you're on the air with uh, Stephen Cohen. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, I have in front of me a book. It was originally titled The Belarus Secret. It's by John L. Loftus. He brought it out in 210. Revised, titled America's Nazi Secret. He describes how we brought these war criminals home secretly the Department of Justice, we hid them, and we're going to use them for future use, parachute them into these countries. 
when the opportunities are right. I know that's long past, but I think, do you think that they're scratching that old itch? It's a good question, Rick, and I know the history you're talking about, and it is true that we brought Nazi intelligence agents and Nazi nuclear scientists to help us fight uh, the Soviet Union after World War II. It was an uh, ugly episode. I don't, the itches may still be there, but here's my reaction in terms of current events. Let's say there have been, I don't know the numbers now, there are tens of thousands in the streets of Ukraine. In November, December, it was hundreds of thousands. Overwhelmingly, these are decent people. These are honorable, democratic, liberal-minded people who just want to be part of Europe. And that's their right. That's what history created. But there has emerged a smaller group, maybe 5 10%, who are ultra-nationalist to the extent that they are quasi-fascist. Uh, quasi-fascism, fascism, has a long history in Ukraine. Uh, many Ukrainians fought with the Nazis in the destruction of Russians and Jews and others in Ukraine in World War II. Uh, these people are small in number, let's say 5%, but they're very well organized, they're armed, they're funded. They, unlike most of the politicians, know exactly what they want, and they dislike Europe and America every bit as much as they dislike Russia. What I don't understand is why the American media hasn't brought the attention of reading Americans and the American political elite to this growing danger. They are the ones who are throwing Molotov cocktails, that is, glass bottles filled with kerosene with a lit rag in it, at police and rocks and steel bars. That kind of behavior would not be tolerated in any Western democracy. It would be shut down immediately. Um, and yet, the, the impulse behind it, this ultra-nationalist, quasi-fascist impulse, is either not mentioned or dismissed as marginal. But we know from history that a small group uh, can have an enormous political impact when everybody else is confused and uncertain about what to do. So I think this is a grave danger, and fascism has risen its head, raised its head across Europe, largely in reaction to the austerity policies of the EU governments, and it's now visible in Ukraine. And I think it's a grave, grave, grave danger. I, I mentioned in the tease uh, at the very beginning of the hour, uh, could this be World War III or something to that effect? Um, uh, I, I, we've got callers from Kansas and Colorado and Illinois, New York and Alabama and other places that want to talk to you, but just, I, I have to get this question in. Uh, moderator's privilege, I guess. Are, is it possible that we're looking in Ukraine at something that is not dissimilar from what we saw in 1914 in Sarajevo when Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated and suddenly the world was plunged into World War I, and to this day nobody can really explain why? Uh, I don't know, Tom. I mean, I have this policy of what I don't know, I say I don't know. I, have, I, know, I understand that analogy, and because we're at the... 100th anniversary of World War I, people have been talking about it. I think there are at least two differences, though. We know, or at least I think I know, the cause of this crisis in Ukraine. I mentioned it before. It's the U.S.-led Western march on post-Soviet Russia for the last 25 years, and they're at the gates of Kiev now. It's a long process. The other thing is, let's say the world had to choose. This is a kind of silly or frivolous uh, hypothetical, but let's say the world had to choose between, to put it crudely, uh, Obama and Putin. Uh, we present Putin in this country as a marginal evil figure in world affairs, but the fact is he has admirers in many, many, many populous countries, beginning in China, uh, in India, in many countries where, whether we like it or not, you and I, because we're progressive guys, but where what we call progressive social policies are hated in those countries, where women don't have equality, gays don't have equality. This is, I think, numerically the majority of the world's population. And were we to try to divide the world into a confrontation, the numbers may not be with us. Yeah, indeed. Uh, pardon my cough there. Um, Michael, listening on AM760 in Denver, Colorado. You're on the air with uh, Professor Stephen Cohen. Good afternoon, Professor and Tom. Uh, I want to make a quick comment here and, and get your opinion. 
I've read a lot. I just finished a book by David McCullough, Truman, a biography. A lot about what uh, post uh, World War II Europe and what was going on in the world at that time. I've come to believe that there is that there's never really existed communism except for on the written page. Karl Marx, Friedrich Engel, whatever. Everything that has transpired to this day has been either a fascist form of totalitarianism or a uh, left-wing uh, pseudo-communist form of totalitarianism. I, if you can give me a book where that might be confirmed by someone, I'd love to read it. Now, I'm reading 1914 right now, Tom. I'll give you an idea of why uh, the World War I started. But that's my comment, if there's a book or anything. And am I right in starting to think that, boy... After World War II, we did a great disservice not to try to work with the Soviets' different political system, but to say, hey, we're the victors. Let's get together here and rebuild the world. Thank you, That's Mike. my comment. Um, the last question about what we should have done after World War II would take us where I'm not sure Tom wants to go right now. Uh, you can go anywhere you want. <laughs> the first question is very <laughs> profound. Uh, what is this thing we've called communism? in the 20th century. My own teacher, mentor, friend, best man at my wedding, Robert C. Tucker, whose two-volume biography of Stalin is surely the best that exists. He died at 92, two, three years ago. He believed that every communism, every regime that called itself communist was national, and that therefore Russian communism would be different from Chinese communism, or from Polish communism, or from Cuban communism, because it can only be stable, the idea of communism, the ideology, if it integrates with the national traditions of a country. So Tucker has a book. I don't remember the exact title, but Communism and Political Culture is in the title. It's a collection of his essays on that subject. There are two Robert Tuckers. You want to look up Robert C. Tucker, and there you may get a, a very scholarly um, reply. Briefly, I'll tell you an anecdote that I've never forgotten. We just have a half a minute. Back in the 1950s, the leader of the French Communist Party was asked how he, a man of the left, could support Moscow. And his answer was, Moscow's not the left, it's the East. Mm. That's something that seems to me to be sensible. Yeah, indeed. I absolutely agree. And, let, and for the record, let me say that there are, in my mind, no limits on what you can say or what opinions you, you could express on this program at all. Uh, I may disagree with you, but if so, I'll say so. But so far, everything... It, it just, I didn't know. If we start with who began the Cold War after 1945, we will be here at least until the next World War. Oh, so that's what you meant. In, in, right. in other words, it would take so long that we, we, we don't have time for the show. I don't want to go subject-wise. Okay, I understand, I understand perfectly. Uh, I just didn't want my listeners to think that we get guests on and say, here's the, thing, here's the list of things you can't talk about. We don't do that here. Uh, Stephen Cohen is with us. We'll be back with more of your, your calls and questions for Stephen Cohen right after this. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. And check out Professor Cohen's new piece in The Nation magazine, Distorting Russia, How the American Media Misrepresented Putin, Sochi, and Ukraine. TheNation.com. Welcome back. Uh, you're still with us, Dr. Cohen? I am. Steve? Okay. Jerry in Long Island, New York, listening to WBAI. You're on the air with Dr. Cohen. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for taking my call, and uh, welcome to your guest. Yeah, I have a question for you, Professor Cohen. I have a, co well, I have a comment and a question. First of all, my comment is this. We have this push now by the military-industrial complex, the defense contractors, to waste the uh, more taxpayer money on this time on this new F-35 Joint Strike fighter jet, which is designed to fight Russian and Chinese aircraft, uh, with the Pentagon reportedly uh, planning to buy at least 100 a year of these uh, new F-35 uh, fighter jets, and uh, according to 60 Minutes this past Sunday. And that leads me to my question, to what extent uh, I'd like to know uh, from your guest, uh, Professor Cohen, to what extent would you agree with me that it's a great mistake to overlook the degree to which the military-industrial complex, the defense contractors, are really behind uh, trying to stir up 
a new Cold War with Russia in order for these defense contractors to stir up more business for themselves. So Jerry's kind of echoing my conspiracy yeah. theory, uh, Well, Steve. it's not conspiracy, it's business. Business yeah. isn't a conspiracy. They just are a little quiet about it. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, first of all, we've got to feel sorry for Jerry, who's probably been snowbound out on Long Island for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, Jerry, um, I... I it's a driving force. Is it the most important one? I don't know. It is a one, but still worse. Russia has a military-industrial complex. Uh, they fell on very hard times with the end of the Soviet Union, and Russia became demodernized. It suffered in the 90s, partly thanks to the, what we recommended as economic policy called shock therapy, uh, a worse depression, statistically, than we experienced in the 1930s. One argument in Russia about how to remodernize the country is to let the military-industrial complex do it. It was so big in the Soviet system. It's the most technological sector they have. So fund them. Give them, all, give them the what They'll drive it. They'll create jobs. They'll build infrastructure. We've heard this argument from other laggardly countries that military-industrialization is the quickest and best way. Plus, you get a bang for the buck. You get a lot of security. Well, it worked for us in the late 40s, or in the early 40s, rather. Exactly. Other people say, no, 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 you don't want to do that. That's not good for the people. This argument goes on, but what we do know, Jerry, is that the two military-industrial complexes, Russian and American, they feed off each other. Uh, there was a great uh, meeting at one point between Eisenhower and Khrushchev back in the 50s. Khrushchev had some military experience, but not much, and he hadn't consolidated his power. And his generals kept coming to him in the 50s and saying, you know, the Americans got this new weapon, we've got to get it too, and you know, the Americans have more of this, we've got to get more of this. So Khrushchev said to Eisenhower, do you ever hear that uh, from your generals? And, and Eisenhower said, uh, Nikita, or whatever he called Khrushchev, I hear it every day, but you know, I got an advantage. I was a general, I know what they're up to, and I tell them to go F themselves. Uh, the pressure that a military industrial staff can bring on a civilian president uh, when they come in and tell scare stories about how their country's falling behind and, vulner and, is, and is vulnerable is a driving force. And I think that we are spitting distance as we talk from a new nuclear arms race. And what's driving it today are these missile defense installations we're building. Because Russia understands that the best defense against them are more short-range nuclear missiles. That missile defense system, which is problematic to each other, its workability is highly unlikely. Nonetheless, is trillions and trillions of dollars of investment. You know, there used to be a... Hang on, hang on just a second, please. Welcome back, Tom Harvin here with you, and on the line with us, the author of the new piece, uh, the new cover story in The Nation, Distorting Russia, How the American Media Misrepresent Putin, Sochi, and the Ukraine, uh, Professor Stephen Cohen, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU in Princeton, and uh, did you want to finish the thought, sir? Well, uh, people often ask, uh, what, uh, why are we building a missile defense system, which many scientists tell us really can't work. I mean, that's another story of why it won't work. And what comes to my mind is a joke that used to be told about, uh, uh, about the United States Congress. And the, the question was, what is an indestructible military weapon? And it's one funded in all 50 states. There you go. Yeah. And now we've got a missile defense system that's being funded in every NATO country plus Israel and a few others. Yeah. It's good for the business of these countries, and they know it won't work, but they're happy to take the installations and take the money. Back and driving in, the arms race. Yeah. In, in, in 1964, I was 13 years old, and I went door-to-door -door with my dad for Barry Goldwater. <laughs> um, three years later, I was you know, getting arrested and tear-gassed in East Lansing in anti-war protests and, and as part of SDS. But um, I remember that mentality of, the Russians are going to bury you. And they, in fact, the quote was taken out of context, apparently, but, but it was used so widely. Um, well, actually, we've got a caller who I think may, may be bringing this topic up. Uh, David in Chicago, you have a quick question for Dr. Dr. Pro I, I, Professor I, Cohen. Hi, Professor Cohen. I haven't read any of your works yet. I look forward to reading this uh, story, uh, this article in The Nation. I haven't read Tucker, but I've read Simon Seabag, Montefiore, Donald Rayfeld, 
uh, and conquest, uh, harvest of sorrow. So I'm I'm very familiar with this topic. I feel I feel like given recent events of the 60 Minutes piece this past Sunday on the corruption in Russia, and then what happened to Mr. Kraft, the New England Patriots having his ring stolen by Putin, and then the State Department covering that up. I wonder how much of that um, business influence has been on the current events. But but getting back to the history, we want to be have history be our guide, not our master. But given the murderous regimes under the Bolshevik Soviets of 60 million people around being murdered uh, by their own government, I, I think a lot of people are not, cannot be sanguine about this country and how they've never really reformed. And remember, it was Putin's grandfather that worked in the kitchens of Lenin and Stalin, and that's how he was tracked to get into the KGB. So I, I think that's why people find this, this regime problematic, despite Putin's recovering the economy, you know, with his sovereign wealth fund. Yeah. We, see, we see this corruption today, and the murderous, and, and, and this 60 Minutes piece really brings a poignancy to current problems that, that find Russia problematic for Americans. You, the 60 Minute piece you're referring to the profile they did of William Browder. Exactly. I'm going to tell you right now. Thank you, David. That you can absolutely not trust that man's version of what happened to him in Russia. You cannot. You ask him how he made billions of dollars in Russia in the 1990s. But here's the larger implication of what you just said. Let's say you're right. That means that a people, the Russian people now, are condemned in our judgment forever for what their leaders did 50, 60, 100 years ago. If we did that, uh, Germany wouldn't be our dear friend today. If we did that, we wouldn't be our dear friend. We had slaves. (laughs) We wouldn't be our dear friend. That's correct. So, I mean, at some point, you've got to draw the line. And you're right. History is a judge, and Russia has historical impulses. But I don't think Putin is a murderer. I don't think he's a killer. I don't think his regime is murderers. I mean, I'm a Henny Youngman man, the famous Borscht Belt comedian. When asked, how's your wife, he said, compared to what? If you tell me, is Putin a killer, I would ask you, to compared to whom? Hmm. I mean, yeah, he's killed, his forces have killed Chechen terrorists and, 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 and Islamic terrorists in the North Caucasus, who are fighting, by the way, now in Syria and Afghanistan and other places. But to call him a murderer and imply that he brought about the death of a, of a political opponent, yet there is no evidence. I know people talk about it. I guarantee you there's not a shred of evidence. And in one case, the case of this Russian KGB defector who was poisoned in London by polonium a few years ago, it's not even clear the guy was murdered. Scott Yard will not reduce the, uh, release the autopsy. Hmm. We don't know how the guy died, but it's equally possible he was carrying around that polonium in his pocket to sell it, to try to show he could get polonium on the black market. It leaked into his system, and the only reason that Scott Yard might not release it, I digress briefly, but to show you what the media does is that the, that the autopsy may show there was far more polonium in him than in the so-called teacup he drank. So these, these charges, Putin's, I, I don't want Putin married any of my daughters. I don't want Putin as my president, but that's not what we're talking about. This business, he's a thug and a killer, is undermining our national security. It's got to stop. We've got to have priorities. Yeah, we've done business with a lot of... Um, I, I, we have... We only have one minute left. John uh, has a question. The next question I was going to put up was, could the, the TPP be related to Russia and Ukraine? But but let me, I'll throw that out, in, but you know, we have a minute to wrap it up if there's a okay. point you want to make. No, the point is, Tom, is that what you and I are talking about here today is something that needs to be talked about in the mainstream media. I'm not prepared to sit here and say I'm right, and the people who say I'm wrong are wrong. But if we can't get a discussion of the kind we should have in a democratic society going about the most fundamental questions of national security, we're in for rough times. And they're being adumbrated, foreshadowed, in those fires burning in Kiev as we talk. Yeah. And so our response should be to encourage both our press and our politicians to engage in conversation rather than, rather than simplistic rhetoric? I mean... A good question is better than a lousy answer, and our media is full of lousy answers, and they don't tolerate new questions. Yeah, it seems like that's that's the, our truism for the day. Uh, Professor Stephen Cohen, contributing editor to The Nation, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU and Princeton, his most recent article, Distorting a Russia, 
Distorting Russia, How the American Media Misrepresents Putin, Sochi, and the Ukraine. It's in The Nation, the March 3rd edition, thenation.com. And, of course, on, on, on bookstands and his book, which is now out in paperback, is Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, which examines the new Cold War. Professor Cohen, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Tom. It's been a, an honor and a pleasure.